Gracious Heavenly Father, we, uh, we come to your word this morning and acknowledge that it is uh, your word. It is the authority for all that we should believe, all that we should practice. Father, it is the revelation of yourself to your people. And Father, we, we want to understand it rightly. We want to be challenged by it. We want to be encouraged by it. We want to grow. We want to, uh, to be made more than what we are. Father, we want to be made more like Jesus Christ. And so, confessing that we believe that these are your words given to your people for their benefit, for their blessing, for their in instruction and encouragement. Father, even for our rebuke, if that is necessary, Father, would you accomplish these things by your Holy Spirit in us this morning as we come to your word. I pray this in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, we finally hit uh, the, the home stretch here in our look at the kingdom of God, at the overview of a Bible. And as we, uh, if you make your way uh, back to um, the book of the Revelation, and as I've heard other people say, if you don't uh, learn anything else today, then maybe that's the one thing that you learn, that it's not Revelations with an S, it's Revelation, the Revelation, or John's Revelation. Uh, not that that matters a great deal, but... You know, sometimes as teachers, we nitpick over things like that. <laughs> um, I don't know if uh, you, you are one that's chosen to kind of just remove yourself from all of the, the news and the crazy that happens out there, or if you're someone that really just digs into it. I happen to run across, I mean, <laughs> I mean, it's hard to understand sometimes what to think about a world that seems to just be absolutely turned on its head. Uh, turning things into uh, a matter of, of law that have always been a matter of private discretion or have been just considered wrong and, and making them now the right thing to see people in unrest and tearing their world apart at the core. Um, I watched a, a clip of a, a man who went to minister about... Um, uh, I think he, he gave some sort of talk of the biblical view of human sexuality at a public university, which was brave. I saw the uh, just a clip of the Q and A. There was a there was a whole room full of very angry people, um, angry people, half of whom would come to the microphone and say, "I'm a Christian, and yet this is what I think or believe." But what they would espouse were things that um, were not matters of unclear teaching in scripture they were flatly contradictory to the teaching of scripture yet they would tell others and themselves that they're a christian and i thought this guy is he's getting into some of these arguments but uh, we're in a world where you can't just take labels for what they are and it's hard to label what we have going on and it's hard to live in a world where in one breath we would say the bible says such and such might be sinful or wrong but not be given the opportunity to get to the next breath where we say, and here's God's response or answer to it. When the world expects you to say, and though, therefore we hate you and you're going to hell, and what we would say, and here's the gospel. There's so much hatred. It's so vile. It's so off the rails. We can't have rational conversations. We can't debate things. We can't even see straight and think straight. And we just think, what in the world is this? What is going on? This is, we've always had disagreements, but when's it ever been like this? And what do we do and what hope is there? We saw last week as we began to look at this idea about the second coming, I think that it's right if someone says, what's the world coming to? And we say, an end. It's coming to an end. And we can all agree on that. And all Christians should agree on that. The Bible clearly teaches that this life, as we know it, is coming to an end. We confess that this morning. Christ is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, but he will come again. And when he comes, he comes to judge the living and the dead. No one escapes the judgment. Christians won't be judged for their sin. That judgment has already taken place on the cross. Christ bore the wrath, the judgment of God on sin for his people. Nevertheless, we will be judged for what we did with what we were given. Each one will have to account for what we did with the time, the breath, the resources, the energy that we had, the opportunities that we had. It's coming to an end. How it comes to an end is a matter of some debate. 
And uh, I've tried, I've labored to try and show that there is a great deal of teaching about this matter of what we call eschatology. That's just the study of last things <clears throat> prior to the book of the Revelation, right? So that we don't think that we're completely dependent on this last book, which is difficult for so many people to understand. We're not solely dependent on that one book to give us a clear understanding of what Scripture teaches about how the end will come about and what it means to us and why it matters and what to expect and what we should do. Nevertheless, it is in Scripture, and it is probably one of the most beneficial books that Christians could read. But we don't often see it that way, and some of that has to do with the way in which we read it, the way in which we've heard about it. I heard one person say, another pastor, and he was reading different surveys, and of all the books in the Bible surveyed among uh, the church members that they wanted to hear taught, uh, Revelation was at the top of that list. That's the one book they really want to hear. And when pastors are surveyed about the one book they would want to teach least, that also is the book at the top of the list. Nobody wants to preach about it, and everybody wants to hear about it. And so <clears throat> um, I thought maybe that would be a good reason why that's where we should start. We've all got questions about that, myself included. And I have to say that um, I have started this series that I'd like to start with you, but I'm going to go along through it with you. I haven't finished it completely. I haven't seen the study guide. I, uh, I have seen a great deal of work from this pastor, Robert Godfrey. And um, so as we go through his work, The Blessed Hope, in our Sunday school starting after Easter, <clears throat> uh, I feel very, very confident that what we're going to get is a very sound biblical teaching. And so if you want to look him up, you're, you're free to do that. Uh, and it is more of an overview. It's not a super in-depth study, but it'll give us a good place to start, and hopefully it'll give us a lot of good conversation to have. So I hope that you can maybe start making plans for that. But as we come to the book of the Revelation, and we try to understand what this book is doing here and what are we to do with it. Uh, some have said that it is the most practical book for New Testament believers in the entire Bible, or at least the entire New Testament. And so as we start this morning, I wanted to just go over some issues. I wanted to talk about, uh, and we're not going to go all the way into it. We're not going to get into a lot of detail. We're going to save some of that for the weeks to come, some of the different approaches that people take to this and so on. But we want to at least start to understand what this book um, offers to us. So we want to talk about the author and when we think it was written. turns out that actually does make quite a big difference uh, when you think it was written. Uh, the reason, the occasion, the structure, some of the main themes that are there, the overall fit into the big picture. And so I w if you would turn to the first chapter there, I just want to read the first chapter to you. I know that's, that's a, a lengthier section than we normally do, but it's a, it's a good start. It'll get us started, I think. Revelation chapter 1, verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, from the seven spirits who are before the throne, from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, the ruler of the kings of the earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom of priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother, and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum 
and to Thyatira, and to Sardis, and to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me. And on turning, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands are one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in full strength. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last, the living one. I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore, and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you have seen, those that are, and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. There's a lot there. I hope that during the course of our study, as uh, we prepare for it, or as we come to it here, or as you, if you want to wait as, until we start Sunday school, uh, one of the things that often has been uh, uh, said to be helpful to so many Christians is to read this book out loud. Uh, there's a blessing for reading it out loud, if you will. And uh, it makes sense better if you read it out loud. I mean, if possible to read it out loud in one sitting, but uh, the least amount of chunks to hear it as a whole makes more sense than in chunks. And I hope over the last year we've been seeing that looking at things as a whole can help things make much more sense than just chunking apart little pieces. So let's just start taking a look at this book. First of all, who wrote this book? There is some disagreement in some circles, but uh, conservative Bible-believing Christians, and I won't say unanimously, but... Uh, the vast majority of, of understanding here is that this is not another person named John. This is John the Apostle, the one who wrote the Gospel of John and the one who wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, the epistles, John's letters. This is the same Apostle, uh, the one who sat next to Jesus at the Last Supper, the one to whom Christ spoke while he was on the cross, that John. This is that John. And he was in exile on Patmos, uh, some traditions hold that he actually had been boiled in oil but miraculously survived and then was exiled for preaching the gospel, for preaching about Jesus Christ. But this would be John the Apostle. When was it written? Now this, this actually, um, sometimes it doesn't seem to matter too much. This one actually does have a bit of an impact. There are really two different camps. Um, all of them would agree that this was written in the last half of the first century. But there, is, there are really two camps. There's an early camp and a late camp. <clears throat> and the reason for that is that it, it's clear that when this was written, the church was under persecution. Um, the early camp would side somewhere between 54 and 68 AD, somewhere during the reign of Nero. And they would say that this, this, this was written during the reign of Nero. There are a number of ways in which it's easy to see in the context of that day that the whole idea behind the 666 comes out um, to be pointing at Nero pretty clearly. Uh, there is a strong tie to a lot of the events that happen here as being tied to the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in 70 AD. If that's true, this needs to have been written before that. And they would argue from the internal evidence that it seems like the book itself is saying it has to have been written before that. There is, however, the, the majority camp probably is the late camp, so the, that it was written somewhere between uh, 81 and 96 AD, so the last uh, two decades. So that, that would be after the destruction of Jerusalem, after 70 AD. And there's a great deal of evidence to suggest that that might be true. It's, it's um, external evidence, uh, accounts of other people like Irenaeus, uh, that's where I'm going to operate from because you have to come down somewhere. It really, 
it, there's too much of a difference in the way that you read this to not pick at least one thread to follow. You can't really interpret this book uh, consistently if you don't come down one place or the other because it's very different the way you read it if you think that this is before or you think that this is after. If you think that it's before, a lot of this already works itself out in 70 AD. The, I mean, the destruction, the siege of Jerusalem by Rome was absolutely one of the most heinous things in all of history, especially for the people of God. I mean, to wall off a city, to lay it on it until people start throwing themselves off the walls and eating their kids. And, and it, was a, it was an absolutely heinous event. So it's very easy to understand this idea of all of the terrible things that we sometimes see happening as being portrayed as a judgment, a coming, if you will, of Christ in the clouds in a spiritual sense, an acting judgment in the destruction of the temple at 70 AD. If this is written after that, those interpretations don't fit very well. So you have to come down somewhere. I'm going to, I'm for now, and, I, and I'm open. I'm open to the, to the idea that it, maybe it was the early one. Just because it seems less likely doesn't mean that it's impossible. And both of those camps, within certain boundaries, can be inside. We've talked about what's inside the circle. Where can we disagree or not be sure yet or haven't come to an agreement yet? And we can have good discussion. But as we're having that, we're sure we're all inside the circle of you're still Orthodox. You're still Christian. This is, this is still biblical. Uh, I think both of those dates are inside the circle. It's inside the circle. If it's late, this is not the reign of Nero. This is the reign of an emperor called Domitian, which also was very anti-Christian, and there was a lot of at least local persecution of the church. And it's in a time when a lot of, of the, the uh, local rulers of different Roman colonies were enacting um, sort of a, a, a cult worship, to ingratiate themselves to the emperor and they would force people to worship the emperor and so this is this is something that really did take place quite a bit during Domitian's reign I think there's a lot of evidence to say it probably is more likely that it's the late date rather than the early one it's the majority opinion and we're going to go forward with with a late date and I mentioned already then why why would this be written of course God has his reasons for giving his word um, but in terms of the occasion, what, what purpose was this serving? A number of things. There was a rebuke, especially in the first part to the letter of, to the churches. Some of them need to be rebuked, like Ephesus, right? You've lost your first love. You started out well, but you've kind of petered out in a race and you've gotten off track here. Other churches uh, under intense persecution, so there's need for encouragement. There's need for reassurance. There's need uh, to be encouraging Believers who are under, in some cases, intense persecution to hold fast, to hold the line, to not give up, to not quit, to overcome. It was under an incredible amount of pressure. There were errant believers, people who called themselves Christians or who were associated in some way with the church, but were unbiblical and needed to be corrected. Some of them were simply weak. And the temptation to just give in to the pressure of the world to not suffer so much they could alleviate their physical suffering by just, just compromising. Just, you know what, just give in a little bit. It's not going to be a big deal. And they needed to be strengthened and encouraged. No, compromise is not okay. In so many places, that is what we would shoot for. But in these matters, it is not okay to compromise. And some were simply weary. They had held the line. They had remained strong, and they had done it and done it and done it. And when you get weak, it's so very easy to give in and they needed to be encouraged and reassured often you hear in this book words like overcome endure persevere you can really see what john is saying what the lord is giving to his people is this message yes i know it's hard yes i know it looks like evil is rampant yes i know you're being tempted you're being pressured you're being persecuted victory is certain for those that remain faithful. If you will overcome, God is still on the throne. God is still at work. Victory is coming. Don't give in. Don't give up. It is not, as so many people think, a puzzle book. Uh, Vern Poitras says that this is a picture book, not a puzzle book. I think it's helpful if we see it that way. This is not a puzzle. We're going to talk about the way it's written. And it does seem very 
confusing. There's a lot of symbolism. There's a lot of, you know, what does this number mean? And, that, and the numbers are important and the colors are important. And, but this is also a reference to things that would have been known. And the name, Revelation, is the English word. This is the apocalypse. That word means a, a, re, a revealing, not a hiding. Not as, as like, um, I believe it was Daniel, right? He was given some things and told to seal them up in a scroll. Write this down and then shut it up, close it. It's not for you, not for now. John, on the other hand, is told, write this down, show this, send this out. This, this book is for the purpose of making things known so that we might see kind of, in a sense, what's going on behind the scenes of human history. We see what's going on in our daily lives and we wonder, what in the world is God doing? You know, what is, what is happening out there? I mean, how could this be for good? How could that? This is the book that shows you what's behind the curtain. If we understand what we're reading, if we understand this was written to real Christians in a first century world and they were being persecuted much like some of our brothers and sisters are ever, and have been ever since this day and much like some of us are concerned we might soon face even in this country. Something we have not ever genuinely really experienced. And we wonder... Thank God, the wheels are coming off here. What is up? Where did you go? This book helps us to understand the way in which there were other Christians who were dealing with things much worse than we are and had all the more reason to ask, did I put my faith somewhere that is not going to be helpful? It's not going to pay off? I'm suffering for nothing? Or is God really doing something? Am I going to get what was promised? Is, is, is there a reason why I'm going to stick this out? Should I offer my head to be taken off for the name of this person? Is there any reason for that? This book, more than any other book in the Bible, probably shows us what is going on behind the scenes. And it's very, um, it's a picture book. There are lots of pictures, there are images. Some people have suggested, you know, if you, if you just have your kid read this out loud and ask them what it means, they get so much closer to the real meaning of this book than so many of us adults would. Because they get pictures. They understand what a picture book is. They understand uh, symbolism sometimes in so much many more sophisticated ways than we do because we overthink things and we read into it and we think it has to be saying this or it has to be saying that. Just to read it for what it is. But it is an unveiling to make known things to the church. So what's the structure then of this book? First of all... In terms of the genre, like what were people writing? Are they writing letters? Are they writing narratives? Are they writing poetry? Are they writing, what are they writing? So largely, this is an, an apocalyptic book. Even if you look in verse one there, uh, the word that John uses for to show is a word that has meant in the Old Testament, especially like in, in the Septuagint. That was when the Greeks in the New Testament Jews, right, had a Greek New Testament, okay? After they come back from exile and they have the Old Testament in Greek, not in Hebrew. I mean, some of them have it in Hebrew for sure, right? But, but a lot of times when you see New Testament authors quoting the Old Testament, the version they're quoting is the Septuagint. It's the Greek version of the Old Testament. And this word here is a word that is used in the Old Testament uh, for symbolic things, to, to sign something, to, to say something in terms of a picture, okay? So this is, at, by its own admission, using symbols intentionally to communicate things. One of our problems with this is that we're not familiar with the key to what those symbols mean. You know, if you see symbols on a map, I mean, what, what does that mean? I get what X means. That means I should go and dig in a, a, you know, there's treasure there, right? Some of us on long trips, we're looking for that one sign that says there's a bathroom right here, right? Otherwise, I'm just looking for a sign that says there's a tree right here, <laughs> But I know what that means because I've got a key or I've got a legend and the key or the legend for, for so many of these symbols is the Old Testament. And we don't know our Old Testament very well. That's why I spent the better part of what we've just done in the last year going all the way back to the beginning. And so many of those, and we're going to get to this, I'm, I'm kind of skipping ahead of myself here, but I'll just, I'll just get to that point as it is. So this is from uh, Beale's commentary. It says it's difficult to understand Revelation without understanding the Old Testament. Scholars estimate that as many as 278 out of the 404 verses in Revelation contain references to the Old Testament. 
and that over 500 allusions, that is not a direct quote, but an allusion to something that is in the Old Testament. So it's not quoting the Old Testament, but it is, it is speaking of something that was in the Old Testament. Over 500 allusions to Old Testament texts are made in total, compared with less than 200 in all of Paul's letters. This is the most Old Testament book in the New Testament in terms of the sheer quantity. Uh, Isaiah, Daniel, Ezekiel, uh, the Psalms, among probably the four most alluded to books. In terms of the proportion of its length, Daniel 7 through 12, probably the most alluded to. In terms of the sheer number of references, Isaiah is probably the most alluded to. But those are some of the books which we teach the least, right? We go back and look at the narratives. We look at the characters in the Old Testament. But rarely do we preach through the Psalms because it's huge. Rarely do we preach through the prophets because, like, I don't understand what all is going on there. And there's some weird things. And, you know, that was for back then. But those are the books that you would really need a good grip on to even begin to make sense out of this book. And when we come to this book without an understanding of the Old Testament, we don't do a very good job of making sense out of it. Sometimes we have, we have gotten too rigid in our interpretation and reaction. The 19th century liberalism comes out of Germany, says, listen, right, it's a good moral story. Jesus is a good guy. This is all great. But you know what? We don't really think that people rose from the dead or that, you know, made food. I mean, they just stripped the Bible of all of its supernatural business. And the reaction to that, in the States at least, was where fundamentalism came from. The reaction says, no, we're going to believe every word of that Bible just the way that it's written, which was a good, but sometimes you overshoot the mark when you correct something. And what happened in large part that came out of that was this emphasis on what they would refer to as the literal interpretation of the Bible. That's great, right? However, what they really meant by literal was not literal as in this is what it literally means. What they meant was more of a physical interpretation. I'm simply going to take the face value meaning of every word that I find rather than in cases like this where there's a symbol or a reference or an illusion because we're not very keen on our Old Testaments, because we think, oh, well, we're New Testament people, and because w there was a group of people who were so focused on defending and protecting the integrity and the infallibility and the, the, the divine authorship of the Bible, which is great. However, we, we slipped into this zone where we didn't do a very good job of accounting for what it actually meant. We tried to make it very linear and rigid, and I think you're going to see in this book that this is not at all how this particular book is written. And it makes all the difference in the world. So Revelation takes a lot of the Old Testament images and the kingdom of God, right? The people of God from Adam to Israel to Christ and then the church. Uh, the plagues that you saw in Egypt and the plagues and the bowls and the, the seals that you see in Revelation. Daniel's tribulations in exile in Babylon, and then we see Babylon used as a name here in Revelation. Old Testament Jerusalem, and then the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. We see same images, same kind of ideas put to use here. I'm going to save these for another time, but uh, it's worthwhile if you want to jot some of these down. Just in the first few verses of Revelation, in, in verse 6, that's a reference. Sorry, in verse 5, that's a reference to Psalm 89, verse 27. Revelation 1, 5 is a reference to Psalm 89, verse 27. Verse 6 of Revelation. Just jot down Exodus 19, 6. Exodus 19, 6. In verse 7, that's a reference to Zechari Zechariah. There's a Zephaniah, it's not that one, it's Zechariah 12.10. That's just a, this is a few. Well, I'll give you one more. How about one more? In Revelation 1, 13 to 15, this bit about seeing a man with like the white hair and the, the flaming eyes and all that. Jot down two places, both in Daniel 7, Daniel 7, 13 to 14. Daniel 7, 13 to 14. And Daniel 10, 5 to 6. Just in a span of a few verses, how many places would we have been benefited by knowing the Old Testament? 
So I want to just continue to go briefly here, just, just a quick overview. There are a lot of different outlines. If you look at an outline of this book, there's a lot of different ones. Almost all of them include that chapter one is an introduction. The chapters two and three are letters to the churches, these seven churches that John was told to write to. And then from, from chapter four to chapter the beginning of chapter 22 are cycles of visions. And the numbers you're going to find are really important. Uh, just, you know, on your own, go and count the number of times the number seven gets used, even just in the, in the first chapter. It's, it's, it has a meaning. And in that culture and in that day, they used numbers intentionally as a symbol of something. So there are these cycles of visions. I've seen lots of different ones. And you go look up one, you, you'll find a dozen others to go along with it. But generally speaking, you could think of them in this way. Uh, Poitras puts them in this category, seven letters, seven seals from four to eight, seven trumpets from eight to 11, seven symbolic histories from 12 to 14, seven bowls from 15 to 16, seven judgments on Babylon from 17 to uh, 19 or 18, and then seven last things from 19 to 20. Seven seals, seven angels with trumpets, seven bowls, seven, seven, seven. So there are these cycles. And very often what you find are, and then there's an epilogue at the end. There's a last bit, okay? And you'll find a lot of different kinds of outlines of this. But one thing that happens and we're going to see is this idea of recapitulation. It's not linear. It's not one story told from beginning to end. It's like watching a football game and you see them do some, and how many angles, how many pictures have we seen of, of Mahomes and his like horizontal in the middle of the air throw, right? Which wasn't caught, but. <laughs> but how many times have we seen that picture, right? From the front, from the side, from above, from all these different angles. It was one thing that happened. But we've seen different parts of it emphasized by looking at it from different angles. That is what is going on in this book, I believe. It's the best way to understand and I'll show you that later, that there are recaps, that if you go to one place at the end of chapter 12 and then later in another chapter, you find the same thing. It's not one string of events. It's here's what God is doing. And here's that same thing from another angle. And here's that view from a particular angle in heaven or from a particular group of people. And so this changes the story immensely. Then what are the themes? I'm going to try and just get through this. And again, I, we'll fill in these gaps and if you want to know more, then uh, starting after Easter, we'll, we'll gather here for Sunday school in the morning before service. Again, it's a revealing. Often you see God on the throne like a director calling the shots in a movie. And if I don't see the director somewhere and I walk out on the beach, uh, Vaughn tells, or Roberts tells this story, there's this, this lady, she's drowning and I got to go help and I go to find help and I run around the corner and I see this black chair. It says director, oh, it's just a movie. Right? In other words, it looked like there was danger, but the director was in control of everything that was going on the whole time. It was, she was never really in danger. God is on the throne. And sometimes we wonder and we think, oh, there's real danger, this is, this is crazy. But when we look in the book of Revelation, what we find is God still on his throne. Christ at his right hand. What we find is enemies defeated, the people of God victorious, there's no reason to worry. There's no reason to doubt. There's no reason to quit, to give up, to give in. This is a picture book, and it tells us that God is sovereign above all things, and that because Christ was victorious, we will be victorious. It tells us that there's a willingness to suffer for Christ that is the path to victory, overcome, endure, remain faithful, it tells us at the end that the new creation is the fulfillment of all of the Bible's prophecy that God will gather his people in his place under his rule and grant them forever his blessing. It tells us that Satan tries to counterfeit. The Satan, the beast, the false prophets, it's just a counterfeit trinity. He can never really pull off. He's got thrones on earth, but God's got his throne in heaven. Everything God tries to do, Satan tries to do better, and we need to recognize it as a counterfeit for what it is. I'm going to close with this quote from Beale again. One of the great tragedies in the church in our day is how Revelation has been so narrowly and incorrectly interpreted with an obsessive focus on the future end time 
with the result that we have missed the fact that it contains many profound truths and encouragements concerning Christian life and discipleship. The goal of Revelation is to bring encouragement to believers of all ages that God is working out his purposes, even in the midst of tragedy, suffering, and apparent satanic domination. It is the Bible's battle cry of victory. For in it, more than anywhere else in the New Testament, it is revealed the final victory of God over all the forces of evil. As such, it is an encouragement to God's people to persevere in the assurance that their final reward is certain and to worship and glorify God despite trials and despite temptations to march to the world's drumbeat. This is a book written by a pastor for his people. To tell them not to give up. To endure. Yes, I know it looks bad and it looks like it's getting worse and it might. And I would tell you as your pastor, yes, it looks bad. It looks worse, maybe to some worse than it has ever been. But don't give up. God is still on the throne. We've not lost anything. We will not lose anything that has been promised to us. God is not gone. He is still at work. And we'll go into greater detail. Some of the people or some of the interpretive approaches and the, the specific passages, and God willing, we'll do that in the, in the coming weeks. But for now, I just want to encourage you to read this book as a pastor's picture book to his people, to encourage them both in warning and in reassuring sense to persevere with joy and with hope. God's victorious. Amen.